Mark Riedel. I work for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. I am the TMDL project manager for both the Rock River Basin as well as the Milwaukee Harbor Estuary. So combined, it's about 5,000 square miles of the most heavily populated and varied land use in Wisconsin. Um, we've got a lot of great folks doing similar work, similar efforts to what, what you folks are doing. Um, watershed organizations, other DNR staff, agency staff, local government, you name it. Um, just, I guess one thing I wanted to touch on before I kind of jump into things, um, I'm never real comfortable necessarily talking about myself. I live in Albany, by the way. Green County is not officially in my realm of official government duties. Um, so what I'll talk about is kind of fast forwarding or looking at what's going on in other basins. Um, I've got, I guess, over 20 years of experience now doing the types of work I do. I have undergraduate degree in forestry natural resources, watershed management, and then graduate degrees in river and riparian systems, sediment transport and restoration. So typically what my job is, is going around and working on systems that are completely messed up. That's, that's basically my job. And, and I've done it in the iron mines of Minnesota. I spent a number of years there. I worked on the Minneapolis Chain of Lakes doing polluted runoff stormwater on those systems. That was a very successful long-term restoration initiative by a number of communities. The Deep South, um, all over the Great Lakes. And the, one, the reason I'm telling you this is that the one thing that I see in common is for projects that work, and when I say work, I mean there's a vision, there's a long-term goal, there's a number of partners that get together. For the watershed projects that work, the one common element is not a DNR agency, it's not a regulatory agency, it's not the EPA. It is a dedicated local organization that keeps the pressure there, helps keep people on track, says this is our community, we care about it, and we want to see things change. That's the one common thread that I've been able to identify. I've been in federal lawsuits, I've represented the federal government, state lawsuits, um, literally throughout all the eastern U.S. anyway. And so the work that you guys are doing is really awesome, it's exciting. Thinking about 20 years ago when I was starting off doing this stuff, there was nowhere near the level of citizen involvement that we have now. So good job, keep up the good work. Um, I wanted just a little bit of stuff that Jim had mentioned earlier, the idea of um, designated uses, impaired waters. Um, I'll talk about TMDLs. Uh, we don't necessarily have a TMDL for the Sugar River, um, but there's a lot of similarities there. The designated uses are basically, you know, we go to a doctor and I may know that I need to lose weight, I've been unhealthy or whatever. I get my results back from the doctor and the doctor says, you have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, whatever. You need to start taking care of yourself. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to change my lifestyle. I want a silver bullet. I want a Murphy's pill. I want something that's gonna make me better overnight. And that does not exist. We, we, this, we've driven a semi down a narrow alley over the last 150 years and we gotta back it out. And it takes a team of people to do that. Um, the role of an NGO or NGO partners is absolutely critical to making this sort of stuff happen. Um, NGOs act as a coach, they act as the advocate, they act as a workout buddy, um, and teamwork. That's a very important aspect of being a local partner, a local organization, is maintaining that teamwork, that cohesiveness, having people working together. There's things that NGOs can do that I can't do, that I'll never be able to do, or the DNR will never be able to do. Um, that corporations can't do, that sort of thing. So keep up the good work, that's awesome. And another analogy I'll use for you is the this, this speedboat versus a, a ship. We are not riding a speedboat. It doesn't go zoom, 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 back and forth, left and right. Watershed restoration, large scale watershed restoration is about being on a very large ship. And once that ship is going in a certain direction, it's got a lot of inertia and a lot of momentum. It takes a lot of little tugboats pushing and working very hard all together in the same direction to slowly change the course of that ship. All those tugboats have to be coordinated. If you've got other tugboats working the opposite direction, it's gonna take longer, okay? And so that's, that's the process. But once you get all those tugboats working together, once you start to change that trajectory, there, there can be resilience in systems that will help pull that along. And so I just remind people to kind of keep that in mind. It's not an overnight process. But things do get better. I've worked on a lot of projects where watersheds have gotten better, where we've seen significant recovery. And with that, I'll stop blathering. Um, how do I go home? I'm not that far away. Here we go. 
All right, so <clears throat> the Rock River recovery, um, looking at TMDL implementation, implementation, total maximum daily loads. Again, there's not a TMDL right now for the entire Sugar River Basin. There's some smaller ones for tributaries, but a lot of this information is certainly relevant. Um, I'll talk about a brief overview of the TMDL. I'll go into TMDL implementation. I'll talk about point sources and non-point sources. Some of the stuff I'm going to skip through kind of quickly for background information, and like Jim, I'll be here all day. I want to leave time to focus more on some of the later topics. So this is the Rock River Basin. It's 3,700 square miles. The entire area is completely glaciated. There's a lot less relief there than there is here in the Sugar River. There's a lot of wetlands that have been converted either to farmland or they've been flooded and made into shallow lakes. Um, but in general, that's the Rock River Basin. There's a lot of similarities with the Sugar River uh, as well. And so we can certainly look at the Rock River Basin and see you know, what's been done there, what's going on there, and what can we take from that, what can we learn? So a brief overview of TMDLs. This is very brief. Um, <clears throat> the Clean Water Act has basically some requirements in it for states. And we are a state federal partner to implement the Clean Water Act, specifically the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources is. And what that means is we get to implement the Clean Water Act on behalf of our citizens with local control. And that's really important because if we don't do that, if we fail in any different aspect of this, we can have that authority taken away, and then the EPA, from either a regional office or from DC, they implement the Clean Water Act, they make the decisions. And so the lawsuits that I was involved with in the South, the entire state of Georgia, lost its authority. And so the EPA came in, and those people were making decisions about what was right for that state. So it's very important that we maintain that authority. We develop water quality standards. They can be numeric and narrative. Um, we have to inventory our waters. We can't do them all overnight, so we make progress over time, and then uh, we have to identify the waters that do not meet the standards. These are waters that are failing to meet the designated uses, and then every two years, we have to put those on a 3 or 3D list. Now, we've started this process fairly recently. We've only been, is this our fourth iteration? Where's Jim? Anyway, the 2016 list, so we're gonna continue to add to the 303D list. That's inevitable because we've not reviewed all the waters in the state. So when the 2016 list came out, I saw articles in the newspaper and people were saying, oh, our waters are getting worse. They're not getting worse. We're just surveying the population. It's like going to the doctor's office. Has everybody gone to the doctor's office and had their cholesterol checked? No. The more people we check, we'll see some are good, some are not so good. So we're gonna go through this process and update it every two years. For the waters that do not meet their designated uses, we develop TMDLs, total maximum daily loads and those are essentially a prescription. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we then develop restoration plans, or what we call an implementation plan. This last step, there's no legal requirement for that in the Clean Water Act. That's the method that we use, that we've chosen to use here in Wisconsin, that we will develop implementation plans. Uh, that said, we're already doing implementation. We don't have the implementation plan for the Rock River finished yet. We're already doing implementation. We've already written our entire round of permits with TMDL-based limits for the Rock River Basin, even though we don't have the implementation plan done yet. So we don't wait until we get an implementation plan done. In fact, much of this is how we've done business in the state of Wisconsin, our area-wide water quality management plans. We're essentially uh, doing a TMDL type of work. So as I said, the TMDLs are a prescription, and in the simplest sense, it's the amount of pollutant a water body can handle and meet water quality standards. So how many donuts can I eat, how many beers can I drink, and still be healthy? Okay, right, because we all have that little side of us that wants to go and party now and then, right? And so that's what the TMDL does. And it has to break that down uh, into different sources. We have our load allocation, which as you can see from this figure up here, goes to non-point sources. We all think of agriculture, um, but also small communities that are under 10,000 people as of the last census. And then waste load allocation, which is point sources. And we include something that's called a margin of safety. And so we, we look at the pollutants that are causing the source of impairment, and then we back calculate out an allowable amount that can come from all the different sources in the watershed. And this is important because we're not gonna go back to pre-settlement. We've spent 150 years building our society together, building all the things that we want, cell phones, transportation networks, electricity, all these things that we've asked industry, farmers, ourselves, each other to do, um, and we didn't pay attention to water quality. And so we've wiped out fisheries, we've, we've done a lot of, there's been a lot of harmful side effects, and so now we're trying to back that bus out. Um, the pollutant allocations, 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this figure. Probably the, the main thing, I guess a couple things. So above the, above the red line, we've got uh, our, our uh, regulations, NR217 and NR151, and uh, that set limits for point sources or non-point sources. Those apply statewide. And so whether somebody's a point source, non-point source, et cetera, we've got those regulations. Um, we can get water quality, we can get uh, effluent limits, technology-based effluent limits, different types of effluent limits depending on the type of facility. We can get tolerable soil loss for farming or similar things. And we set that based on a statewide requirement. What a TMDL does is looks at that and says, well, what a TMDL does is it actually puts masses on that. How much of the pollution will get it in? Will it get us to that red line? Does that meet our designated uses? Or if our designated uses are even lower, the TMDL will even ratchet it down even more tightly. So in the case of the Rock River Basin, our TMDL limits are actually more stringent than our state regulatory standards. Okay? Ultimately, it's about designated uses. At the end of the day, so our phosphorus criteria, yes, it's a rule. It's a tool to help us get there. But compliance with the Clean Water Act, meeting the federal requirement, is ultimately about designated uses. It's about the things that Jim gets to go out and work with. Fishable, swimmable, what types of fish species, that sort of thing. <clears throat> In the Rock River Basin, if we look at pollutant allocations, and this is, I guess, I'm, there's not a like pointer or something, is there? No, that's all right. So for, there's, there's a couple different ways that we can look at pollution in a stream. We can look at what we call kind of uh, chronic, long-term loading, and we can look at acute loading, which is short-term. Um, we can look at it on an annual basis, or we can look at it over a long time period. We can look at it on a short uh, monthly basis. The Clean Water Act requires us to identify impairments and pollut pollutants that are in a system, but not just on an annual basis. We have to look at the seasonality because we know seasonality is important. We know there's an annual cycle that we live in with this climate in, in, on the earth. And so we know that seasonality is important. For the, developing the TMDL in the Rock River, if we look over the long time period, over the total amount of soil coming into the system, total amount of phosphorus coming into the system, we see that agriculture accounts for 64% of it. When, when does that happen? It's not a hard question. Winter, spring, right. So snowmelt runoff events. Most of our farm fields, even 100% conventional tillage, no cover crop, can take a tenth, two tenths of an inch of rain and not generate runoff. So in the summer and in the winter, that's not much of an issue. It's during melt, snowmelt, and large storm events. So that's the overall largest bulk source. We also have to look at seasonality. When do we really start to see the impacts of degraded water quality in the system? And oftentimes, it tends to be in late summer when our water lake levels are lowest, flows are lowest, um, we're well past the spring recharge, snowmelt recharge. And so we're losing refuge in the streams. Fish have smaller and smaller places to hide and, and try and escape sunlight, try and find temperatures. Similarly in lakes, that's where we're, we're, we're starting to get our lowest lake levels. Lakes are warming up. Um, um, the lakes are well set up. As, and so, you know, seeing algal blooms and that sort of thing. And so we have to look at those conditions when we're seeing our primary impairments in our water, water bodies. And we also say, you know, what's going on then at that time? During those times of year in the Rock River Basin, this is for the rock, so, but in general, during the, those times of year, that's when we're seeing our largest loadings coming from point sources. And there's a difference in these. When we see loadings of phosphorus coming from agriculture, how does that typically occur? We, we often think of soil erosion, phosphorus that's bound to soil particles. And so that phosphorus is not necessarily biologically available. It certainly is an issue, right? When we look at what's coming out of our wastewater treatment facilities, out of our industry, out of cooling water, cooling stack blowdown, metal manufacturing, process water, much of that, in some cases, almost all of it is 100% DRP, dissolved reactive phosphorus. That's phosphorus that can immediately be taken up into uh, the biological system. And so that's why we have to look at both. And so we have to, in the Rock River, and, we, and this is true for all TMDLs, we have to develop our pollutant allocations considering both 
issues. So we have to consider how we're going to address chronic long-term big bulk loadings from agriculture or from runoff from cities. Other non-point sources can also include forestry, roads, that sort of thing, transportation networks. And then the more acute loadings that occur in late summer. Yeah. Just uh, well, what I'm talking about here, yes, this is for just phosphorus. Yep. So. <clears throat> Um, so I'm, I'm glossing over some actually very large topics fairly briefly to get into TMDL implementation because TMDL implementation is really watershed restoration, water quality restoration. And that's why we call it the Rock River Recovery. We don't call it TMDL implementation. We're doing the TMDL work so that we can get recovery of the Rock River Basin and its waters. The way that we do it is with sector teams. So we break out kind of the different parts of our society that utilize the water resource somehow. Uh, oftentimes it's to receive a pollutant load. These are the main sector teams in the Rock River Basin. Oops. Um, I'm only gonna talk about monitoring briefly because Jim covered, can cover this much better than I can. Uh, the DNR, we have, we have some different monitoring programs, protocols. I think the main take home message from this slide <laughs> is that our resources as an agency to do monitoring are very limited very limited, and we desperately depend on partnerships with other organizations, other agencies, et cetera, to help us with monitoring work because our budget is very small and monitoring is very expensive, and we all know that, and it takes a lot of time, analytics, and that sort of thing. And so, yes, while the DNR does monitoring, um, a huge amount of the monitoring work that happens is done by our partners. And much of that data, if, if, the, if it's certified data, it gets loaded into our publicly accessible database and becomes part of that system. And so we, we rely very heavily on our partners for the monitoring. Looking at the Rock River Basin, <clears throat> these are DNR sites. And the key thing here, you know, looking at the rock is pretty much anything you see that's yellow, orange, or red is above the statewide phosphorus criteria. And why is this information really valuable? It tells us things like, for example, um, if I look up here at Lake Sinisippi, I see that Lake Sinisippi is impaired. Lake Sinisippi is very shallow, average depth of three to four feet. It's a flooded marsh. Somebody put a dam on it, raised the water level about three feet, so it's a flooded marsh, it's full of carp. It has phosphorus concentrations on the order of uh, 0.2 to 0.3 milligrams per liter. Um, and working with people in that community, they say, well, there's a lot of agriculture, it's all from agriculture. It's important if we take a step back and we see that that part of Dodge County, Fond du Lac, Green Lake County, there's been a huge amount of agricultural implementation. Farmers have been very proactive, um, DNR, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and what we actually see when we look at this monitoring data is that the phosphorus concentrations and the TSS concentrations in Lake Sinisippi are almost identical to what we see coming out of Horicon Marsh. And Horicon Marsh is a huge sink. So for the farmlands that are contributing to that area, we've got 75 to 90% nutrient management plan, best, best management practices. I mean, these things are not generating runoff. But what we do have is we have a huge marsh complex that's absolutely saturated with phosphorus, full of carp, and it's constantly sediments are being disturbed. That discharges to the lake downstream. And so this is, this is another issue, but this is what the data can tell us. As we start looking at a watershed, we see sources of impairment, and we start comparing, you know, similar to what Jim was talking about, looking at the different streams. You know, does this data point make sense? That doesn't make sense to me. You know, do, you know, do we go after the usual suspects, or are we barking up the wrong tree? And so in this case, with a lot of our shallow lakes in the Rock River Basin, lake management becomes very, very important. Carp issues become very important. Explaining to people that you don't live on a deep north woods oligotrophic lake that's 30 or 60 feet deep. You live on a three foot deep lake, a four foot deep lake that has, it's full of carp and you're running speedboats on it all day long, stirring up all the sediment and tearing up all the vegetation and there's no shoreline vegetation. And so, you know, it's questions like that that this helps to answer. What else does long-term data help show us? And this, I, I just wanna echo, we did not plan this. 
But I want to echo what Jim said and, and earlier to what I was saying earlier. We have made a lot of progress since the Clean Water Act was put in place. No, we're not done. But when we look at our long-term phosphorus levels in the Rock River at Afton, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, you know, you don't need me to tell you what that says. Okay, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing that it says. This is, these are the targets going forward. That's where we want to get. So we're not quite there yet. But we've made a huge amount of progress in the Rock River Basin. And, and there's parts of, the, you know, there's tributaries, parts of the basin that are just like, wow, looking really, really good today compared to 50 years ago. We've hit a lot of the low-hanging fruit, though. And so we're starting to have to make the painful decisions. We're starting to have to, you know, really turn the screws down tight. You know, making decisions that affect society, cause people to get uncomfortable, squirm in their seats, that kind of stuff. Because we've, we've hit all the easy stuff. And so as we get down to these, really trying to get to our, our criteria, that's where everybody has to come together and say, how are we going to do this? Because a big part of this reduction has been the point sources shouldering a lot of the work. Um, and so, but as far as the variability, you know, there could be some other things there. But yeah, you know, point sources have really shouldered a lot of the work. And so you certainly see impacts of point source reduction there, as so well are, as non-point. What are some examples of the hard decisions? Or are you getting there? <laughs> Let's leave those for the panel discussion. <laughs> Point sources, um, I'm going to go, I'm just going to touch briefly on these because I think we all know what the point sources are. Certainly CAFOs are point sources um, and they are regulated. Um, we have a variety of sizes of CAFOs. The ones that mandatorily are given a WIPTES, pollutant, uh, Wisconsin Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permit, are the large, over 1,000 animal units. That works out to be about 7,000 dairy cows, 125,000 chickens, 2,500 hogs. Do you know how many mink we have on the mink CAFO? We have a mink CAFO in Wisconsin. Um, yep. Um, there is strict farm regulation on the production area. Uh, zero discharge. There are inspections. Um, nutrient regulation is through nutrient management plans. Um, the manure from CAFOs is tracked to the field of application through the applicant. So it's not, you know, they can't just sell it and say, oh, I don't have it anymore. Um, I'm not a CAFO expert, that's Mark Kane, and so if there's questions in, in depth about CAFOs, I will point people in that direction. Try to avoid getting myself in trouble. Um, our MS4 communities, so these are cities that are greater than 10,000 people as of the last census, are required to do stormwater management. Um, with the TMDL, we had 53 existing MS4 communities in the Rock River Basin, and with the last Census, seven one MS4 status. Yay, so they get MS4 permits, they're not happy. Um, so we're working very carefully with, with them. It's, it's hard. When you have a city that's 150 years old and you never built stormwater controls into it, and all of a sudden you're giving a, t a TMDL limit, where are you gonna put your practices? So these are the, you know, an example of a hard decision. Do we go to a community that three years ago spent $570,000 to redo a major interchange and now tell them they have to rip it up because it's not compliant with the TMDL? So there's lots of big questions. The way we're doing it in the rock and kind of the model that we're using for the rest of the state is they've got the current permit term. Five years out, uh, they will have a TMDL implementation planning requirement. And so we work very closely with the municipalities um, to do that. And then the following permit term, they develop a compliance schedule and performance benchmarks. And so that's going to be you know, X percentage of our blocks, you know, green infrastructure, different things that they can check off. We're making progress in the right direction. For wastewater, um, in the Rock River Basin, we have 81 wastewater treatment uh, facilities. And actually, we're well over half. We're probably about three quarters of the new limits now. Uh, importantly, we have 32 industrial and non-contact cooling water permits. I have a lot more than that, well over 100 in Milwaukee. And so industry is certainly important. Um, we worked with all the communities in the Rock River Basin, um, going through helping draft permits. Again, it's the public treatment facilities, but it's also industry. It's cheese facilities. It's everybody that's got a discharge permit. And again, these things can be painful. Um, when the facilities were built, we didn't 
weren't fully aware of the impacts of our practices. So as we work with our facilities, they have permit compliance options. They can always upgrade, or what we often call brick and mortar. If we started, if we were to force, and I, I'm using air quotes here, folks, if we were to try and force people to do technology upgrades, we would, businesses can survive. Communities would be wiped off the map, literally. That's why there's been so much stress in the state of Wisconsin over the last three to, three to five years over our fosters criteria. They are stringent. I won't kid you. The things that we're asking our communities to do are not easy. Um, and so we have to go, come in with an open mind and say, how do we work together? How do we do this? We're saying we want things to be better, but we're realizing, holy crap, this is a lot worse than we realized. We've got more work here to do than we realized. And so we need to work together. Absolutely, it's the only way it's going to happen. Some of, the, you know, some of the limits, some of the things that facilities and communities are facing is seriously painful. And, and so that's why there have been lawsuits. And so, you know, I mean, I will be honest with you. I think anybody at the DNR will be honest with you. Um, but we, we arrived at these TMDL limits. We arrived at these water quality limits together as a state. We, we went through this process together. We said, this is where we want to go. And so th this gets to the hard questions. We always work over the communities first to optimize. If they're not planning on upgrading, they don't want to upgrade whatever, we say, well, let's optimize what you've got. You might be able to get there. Or maybe you can do some optimization and a small upgrade and you can get to your permit limit. That would be great. We have a couple of new permit compliance options available, water quality training and adaptive management. I won't spend a ton of time on those. Um, I'm certainly will be available and I know there'll be talk yep, uh, later on about that. Um, but these are game changers. Water quality training and adaptive management are absolute game changers. The, the progress that we've seen in the Rock River Basin, the progress that we're seeing in the Milwaukee boggles my mind in my 20 plus year career. Um, with, without being able to leverage that authority through the point sources and leverage the resources uh, that are available in, in, to the communities that are served by these facilities, you know, we wouldn't be having this discussion. But it's, it's very exciting and it also has a lot of challenges. And again, that's why we sit down, we be nice to each other, we work together, and we find solutions. Uh, individual variance is always out there as an option for a facility. And then down here, there might be something that says multi-discharge variance. <clears throat> and the reason I say that is it's not yet approved by EPA. But all the stress, the lawsuits, the things that I talked about, they've resulted in this multi-discharge variance. And this has required a big rule change for us as an agency. Um, it's requiring a lot of head scratching, a lot of working with EPA, uh, a lot of working with our customers you know, throughout the state, our permitted customers, to try and figure out how this would work, what this would look like. But again, it's not finalized yet. That's why it's grayed out and down at the bottom. <clears throat> so back to water quality training and adaptive management. We know that if we look at surveys of practices that have been put on agricultural practices in particular uh, to reduce soil loss and phosphorus, the, survey of, the surveys that we're seeing is that anywhere from tens of dollars per pound to $100 per pound. When we look in the Wisconsin River Basin, um, some of the stuff that's been done in the Fox Wolf, for most of our practices, we're typically seeing costs that are on the order of $30 to $50 per pound of phosphorus for a reduction. If we wanted to do something that requires pouring concrete, manure storage, cattle exclusions, things like that, the costs start to go up. The reason I mention that is that if I am a municipality and I am going to explore some of these options for my permit compliance, that water quality training or that adaptive management plan gets attached to my permit. And so if I go out and I generate a bunch of credits and they require a whole bunch of cover crops to get put on and there's a drought and those cover crops don't take and so those practices are designated to be failing, guess who's on the line? Is it the farmer? No, it's me falls on the shoulders of the permit holder, okay? So oftentimes we're seeing our permitted facilities going above and beyond, like they might say, I need 100 pounds, I'm gonna generate 200 pounds, so I'm gonna give myself an extra buffer. Or we see them going towards a built practice, like manure storage, exclusions, things that they can drive by, and they're like, that thing is there, and it's working. So there's, um, there's differences depending on you know, what facilities we wanna do, what's available, that sort of thing. 
When we start talking about actually having to upgrade our facilities, we are literally talking thousands to tens of thousands of dollars per pound of phosphorus. Um, I can't tell you who. Um, I've got one facility that I'm working with in, in the Rock River Basin who is actually developing a partnership. They are gonna, probably going to go trading. They were looking at, um, they were looking at around $3,000 a pound. Um, we have a, another community that we are working with who's doing a very exciting adaptive management project. Their present day capital cost requirements to upgrade was over $10,000 per pound. When you looked at the life of their treatment facility and you started including additives, polymers, maintenance upgrade, they were approaching $20,000 per pound of phosphorus to meet the permit limits, right? Now, what if we had permit limits and we forced a community like Albany, where, I'm, where I live, or Broadhead, how many rate pairs do we have? In Albany, I can tell you we've got around, somewhere around 300 rate pairs. If Albany had to do a brick and mortar upgrade, we'd be gone. And that's most of Wisconsin, most of the small communities in Wisconsin. If they had to do upgrades, do brick and mortar upgrades. Um, so that's why, we're, that's why we're talking about these, these alternatives, because they are viable options. 